Pleasure to talk to you, Paul. This is, uh, you know, as being a Canadian boy, the hip is is part of everything. So uh, uh, real <laughs> honor to have a chance to chat with you. Oh, thanks very much. I appreciate it. Appreciate you having me on. Oh, no, uh, anytime. Believe me, the door is always open. Um, so, you know, this is really we're looking at the 30th anniversary of Road Apples, the band's first number one album. For you, does it feel like 30 years since you guys did that album? In some ways, it does. Um, you know, my kids are in their mid-20s, and I didn't have kids yet. So they're a good uh, way to mark time. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, the memories are much clearer than you would ever think um, for 30 years. Um, I remember, um, you know, I remember, I remember it very well. And um, so, I mean, there's upsides to it being 30 years. It's like, ah, all right, we stayed together and, you know, everything went well. Uh, and then, you know, you could say, wow, geez, I wish I was 26 again. But that's, you know, that's, we just can't do that in life. And, um, but yeah, it's a bit surreal that it was 30 years ago, for sure. <laughs> And do you remember uh, when you got the news that the album hit number one since it was the band's first number one album? I do, yeah. Um, I was probably talking to my manager because uh, I don't think I read it, but um, in 10 days it sold 100,000 copies, which was a big deal back then. I mean, today it would be <laughs> a massive, massive deal because no one sells records like that, but um yeah, it was 10,000 copies in 10 days. And uh, it was like, wow, this is really, um, we we thought that we were, you know, a bit known, getting a bit known through the clubs in, in Canada, um, you know, and and uh, including at the Crazy Horse in Dartmouth. And, um, but the appetite for our new music uh, was surprised, I think all of us, it was like, whoa, okay, so so this is good. And, and, you know, it was extra uh, rewarding and satisfying that we were very proud of the record. And so we weren't worried what people were going to think. We, we felt like we had uh, done the best we could and we felt like it was going to be a, a, a record that people liked. Uh, yeah. And I mean, obviously people did. And side note, Crazy Horse doesn't exist anymore. It became a strip club and then it shut down altogether. So sadly, it's not there anymore. Uh yeah, I was kind of making that assumption. I think I had heard that from somebody. Um, yeah, which is too bad. But we had some, uh, well, we had some uh, nights where there weren't many people there at all. But um, we had some good gigs there, for sure. I can't, it's so hard for me to think of a show in Halifax, Dartmouth, where the hip show with not many people. <laughs> like, it's hard for me to picture that. Yeah, well, it was, it was pre- road apples like road apples i i would guess and think that um that's when we played the misty moon you know of which there's like a much music show uh and that was packed and um if we played the crazy horse on that tour which i'm sure we did it would have been crowded but it was in the years before that um where and we happened to go out to halifax a couple times and um yeah uh there was a place in halifax rose's cantina that we played like six nights in a row to you know i don't know six people <laughs> but gradually building it up you know 25 people by the end of the week or 30 or anything you know i think that was a big key to our band is is uh we were okay with that we just thought you know let's go with word of mouth that's all we got and all we had really is our our motivation to write songs and the fact that we felt confident playing live that we felt like we could turn on a room so we just, we were just trying to do that. <laughs> and, you know, going back and, and digging into the, the, what you guys put into this road apples package, uh, I can imagine it was emotional at times. I know uh, Rob had said like there was a version of Fiddler's Green that he had to stop and start again and stop and start again. Did you have any moments like that, whether it was a song or, or photos or anything that kind of made you step back from the project for a bit? Um. I guess, uh, I guess sort of, it, it was, uh, I was taking comfort really, especially in the photos. I mean, yes, in the music, but you know, I know Road Apples and, um, and we had put Saskadelphia out. Um, but uh, the photos, like some of them were just photos that um, I had and maybe have lost or maybe 
uh, that no one had seen before. One photo in particular where we're all on the Harleys. Uh, Lanois had a whole bunch of Harleys and Johnny's at, on the end uh, on a bike. And, you know, there's Gord and Don Smith and Bruce Barris, who was the other engineer. Don was a producer engineer. And they're all gone, you know. And and um, so, yeah, it's, it's tough to see pictures um, of Gord and of Don and, you know, just think, ah. Uh, too bad like really too bad is a, such a light way to put it um so uh yeah it's uh it was tough at times but um you know it, it was probably tougher for Robbie because he was in charge leading the charge uh to put the whole package together he's kind of our art director and um but uh yeah I would say emotional experience but but um in the end, just lucky to be part of it. And then you were talking about some of the pictures that were like ones that you had of your personal collection. There's a lot of personal stuff in the package. Did you have any hesitation about being so personal with this package and sharing kind of everything that you had almost? Yeah, uh, um, not really. I think that comes with um, getting older. I, th I think at a time, yeah, I would have been very uncomfortable and uh, we all would, you know, but I, as we sort of get into being older, you know, in your 40s and now 50s and um, it's kind of like, well, hey, whatever, we did it. We were, you know, a bunch of a bunch of kids, really. And and um, so that sharing, um, I think, is part of uh, maturing that it's OK to it's OK to be it's okay to get emotional. Like all these kind of things are, um, there's kind of a learning curve, uh, at least with me. So, um, not, not uncomfortable at all. Proud of it. And, and, um, was happy, happy and lucky to be there. Yeah. And one of the things that's in the package that I'm really glad is in there. Cause it's kind of this fabled piece of hip history is the Roxy show, uh, in LA. And I was sitting there thinking like the Rockies just down from like the whiskey and you're on the sun set strip. Are there kind of any crazy stories about the hip on the strip? Well, we had played the whiskey um, before. So the Roxy is a step up. Um, we had played the whiskey, you know, in those days we were kind of, we were constantly touring. So we probably were playing LA every eight months or so, but everywhere else in between in America and Canada, um and the whiskey was a big deal when we played there it's like wow we're at the whiskey and um and then we were bumping up to the roxy the next time we came um i remember the black crows were at the whiskey uh backstage I remember thinking chris robinson holy he's so tall um <laughs> and nice um at the roxy in particular um that was that was uh we knew it was going to be a broadcast. And um, so there was a recording truck outside, like an 18 wheeler, these studio trucks. And, um, and it was being broadcast on a network called Westwood one at the time. And um, so we knew it was going out live to radio stations. And we also knew that people were probably putting a little cassette in their, um, in their deck and recording it. And uh, we had Don Smith who had produced road apples end up to here he was doing the recording and we were confident again, we, we just, we played so much and we were just very, very confident together. So it wasn't a feeling of nervousness. It was like, let's get this done. Let's nail it all. And uh, we did, you know, I remember it was a good crowd and it was a cool room. And um, we felt like here we are on the sunset strip, you know, basically playing the biggest bar on it until the house of blues showed up a few years later that Roxy was, that was the spot to play. Yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, like, did you get like nowhere better to have an after party for a concert, right. Than the sunset strip. Yeah. You know, it, it was, uh, and we had, uh, we were signed out of LA. So we had record company people there, which doesn't necessarily make you, uh, uh, less nervous. You know, it makes you a little more kind of tight, um, uh, not tight as a band, but tight as a person. Um, but yeah, uh, no, super cool to be there. And we stayed, you know, we were staying on the strip and um, we really liked it all over the years. You know, it was, um, we were having good gigs there and, and uh, a really interesting and cool 
spot to check out. That's awesome. I, I got one last one for you. When you think back to those first hip gigs where like you're playing a lot of cover songs, there's only a couple of originals, I think in some of the early sets. And then you think now of the tragically hip and not only the growth of the band, but how important it became to a nation. Is that surreal for you? Can you wrap your head around that? Both. Um, I can wrap my head around it and I do have evidence um, here and there. I live in Kingston, a small town, but I, you know, live downtown go out for dinner go to a local pub or whatever and um so the odd time someone will come up and tell me like how much a song or a gig or a record meant to them so it's really i feel very privileged and lucky about that um and so you can wrap your head around it when you're actually talking to people about it but yeah it's surreal as far as uh, how it all went and how it to get right down to the last tour um it's like this uh, dreamlike kind of thing like wow how did this ever happen um but we remember all the times too so that kind of brings it back to reality I remember all the uh you know the dedication it required because we just constantly were on the move either touring a lot or uh writing and recording we were always doing one of those things and um uh, so the daily life was, uh, um, you know, it was a grind and um, really paid off. So, yeah, it's a little bit surreal. Though. <laughs> I would say it paid off. And I, I think I speak for a lot of us when I say I'm, I, I thank you for everything that you did for the band and uh, just for the songs and the memories that you've given us all. It's an opportunity to thank you. So I'm taking it. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Scotty. It's nice talking to you. Yeah. Appreciate and, it. Anytime the door's always open. So uh, <laughs> have a great one. And uh, maybe on the next 30th anniversary, uh, which I think would be fully completely, we can chat about that one. Yep. I'd be happy to. <laughs>